just preach to your church. You know, a Wednesday's a great time for you to just preach to the local congregation. To just those through those faithful, they're through and through. They're gonna stick, they're gonna show up no matter what. You know, if, if it's hot outside, they're gonna show up. If it's hot in, in the congregation, they're gonna show up. Yeah. You know, back in the day they didn't have a AC and people still showed up, but apparently that's not the thing anymore. If it's too hot, people would just leave. But you know, if you'll turn over to Acts. In, in, or actually, just go to Romans 10. Go to Romans 10, and I'll, and I'll read for you the other verses. But the first thing you want to you wanna look at or you want to make sure is, and for most of us here, this point applies in, in, in the second part, is that you want to set your destination, but you don't want to arrive. And what I mean by that is a lot of times you see individuals who are saved or get saved, and, and because they're saved, they've now arrived. You know, they're there. And the reality is, that's actually the beginning of the Christian walk. That's really the start of your Christian. And, and it doesn't matter where you are. You're still in the beginning stages. Think about it. We have an eternity with Christ. We have an eternity of work. We have an eternity of serving the master, being at the, at the feet of Jesus Christ. We are at the beginning. You know, but our destination is already set. It's in heaven. But most of the time, you know, you've, especially if you... If you're around teenagers long enough, you know, my, my father-in-law always says, make sure that you, you learn everything you can from a teenager before they forget everything. You know, once they're, they're no longer teenagers and they don't know everything. You know, teenager knows everything. And one of the challenges that also someone young, not necessarily a teacher, but even young in business, if they experience just a, a small bit of success, what happens? They feel like they've arrived, right? They've stopped learning or they've stopped pursuing that, that, uh, that career. Or they've stopped pursuing that lifestyle that got them to the place where they are now. And one of the things that we need to do when we're looking at the basics is, well, what got us here? Well, the, the most important thing is that we've set the destination. But we know we haven't arrived. We're not even in heaven yet. So we need to focus on what is that, is that road, right? But, you know, uh, just real quick, Acts 16.30 tells us, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. This is really just a I'm just going to do kind of a, a review of the salvation message, right? He that believeth in John 3, 36, it says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. John 5, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. You know, that destination keeps getting said. And then Romans 10, 9, we, we've seen this and we know this. It says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, who believeth on him shall not be ashamed. You know, that word ashamed is you're not going to be let down. It's not just embarrassed, but you're not going to be let down. It says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, you know, if you've not done that, which I really believe the majority of people in here have done that, you've got to get that. Because the challenge is, is what's going to happen next is you're still going to have that struggle with what's the meaning of my life? What's the purpose? What am I supposed to accomplish in life? You know, so I'm saved, so I'm going to heaven. What is it that I'm supposed to do? But the Bible gives us clear instruction that it's the pursuit of Christ, right? It's the pursuit of the gospel. It's the pursuit of the spiritual battle. The reason you're in that spiritual battle is because you're saved. The reason that you're out there preaching the gospel is because you're grateful that you got that free gift. You know, that's the reason you're out there doing those things. So, you know, when you have that destination set and you don't have that mindset that you've arrived, but that that's where you're headed, then then it's going to make things easier for you to reset the basics. You know, uh, a flight. Now, I don't think this is as true today as it maybe was when I learned this. But when I learned this maybe 15, 20 years ago, I remember they used to teach this in sales was that it, it's not about the destination, but about, you know, the journey, right? And they would say that a plane is off course about 90% of the time because it, it's, you know, there's, it's not like we have a straight road when you're in the air. You know, there's wind and turbulence. They have to avoid storms and different things like that. Now with technology, with GPS, it's probably not uh, as drastic. But the reality is it doesn't matter how much technology, you're probably still off course most of the time because there's all these factors that are affecting us. And that's how we are sometimes in our life, right? We know where, where we're headed, 
our, you know, our plane has that trajectory, that GPS, but what happens is, you know, the storms of life come and they knock us off. Or the backsliding of life comes and they knock us off. Or the temptations of life or the, the, the confusing doctrine that someone, you know, planted some confusion in you that you just didn't, you never read that. You know, have you ever read a verse and then you hear something really dumb about it, but then for some reason you think maybe there's something to it and then there you are, there you are following that rabbit trail and you spend days, maybe hours, maybe weeks following that rabbit trail and only realize that, what's the point? I mean, how is this really going to affect my life and the life of others? And people get a, a, an unclear gospel message all the time. They get, you know, wrong information all the time. And why, why is that? Because we're not following the predetermined path that God gave us in the Bible, in His Word. You know, I mean, go, uh, if you will, to Hebrews 12, but I'll read for you 1 Corinthians 9. You know, as we're getting there to our rival, um, what is it the thing, what does the Bible tell us about this, des- this journey? It says in, in 1 Corinthians 9, 23, while you're turning to Hebrews 12, it says, And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run a race run all? But one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run not as uncertainly, so I fight not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Meaning, I... I'm not going to go out there and not be prepared so that I don't, you know, muddy the waters of the gospel message. And, and I mean, we've all, look, if, you, if you've grown in Christ, you've muddied the waters at some point. That's just the part of, of, of growing up, right? You, even when I learned the Romans Road, I just had the Romans Road. Now I added, you know, other scripture. I added Revelation, and I clear up, you know, eternal security with John 10, and I clear it up with John 1, 12, where, we, you know, he tells us that we're his son, we're his children. If I have to, I can go to Hebrews and talk about the chastisement of the Lord for his children. And if you're not his child, then you're, you know, you're a bastard and you, you liken it to your family, things like that. But when I first learned the Romans Road, it was just, you know, Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23, Romans 5.8, Romans 8.1, Romans, you know, you'd go through that. But there's sometimes you, you might skip a, a beat, but the Bible tells us, look, you're running a race. Well, look, how do you run a race? You have to prepare. You have to, you know, train. You have to spend time in the right nutrition. You have to put a plan together. I mean, have you ever seen how these great athletes train? It's, it's like an all-consuming thing. And if we're, we're consumed in this prize, this heavenly incorruptible crown, then we're going to be consumed with the basics of Christ. Sometimes we, we try to find that that uh, the magic bean, right? The bean and the beanstalk that, that get us. But there is no magic formula. There is no fancy uh, button you're going to push and everything's going to work out. What really works out is the repetition of the basics. You know, you're there in Hebrews. In verse 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about, compassed about with, such a, with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which, this, which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I mean, those verses are so powerful. God says, run with patience the race. Man, patience is a, is a virtue that is difficult to obtain. It, in just life, period. You know, and I can talk, I was 25 years as an unsaved individual. So I was already a young adult or a young man when I got saved. And I thought that was hard. Then you get saved, now you're really trying your patience. Because the Christian walk is a tough walk. It's something, but it's something that, that you, you, if you take it in the right context, you do it with joy. And you say, does that really make sense? Well, I mean, you just got to read the, the, the end of that, the, the, at the end of that verse, of verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. I mean, so you think about it. Jesus, who was murdered for being perfect, and he was beat, and, and I mean, they tortured him, and they beat him, and they buffeted him. 
It says that he did that with joy and endured the cross. So how much more should we not enjoy this process? But the only way we're really going to enjoy it is if we're pursuing the right things, right? If we're not, if we're pursuing careers, if we're pursuing money, if we're pursuing, and I'm not, let, let me make that straight. I don't, I'm not asking anybody to be a monk. I'm not here with this false pretense of you got to give up your entire life and walk the world and, you know, find yourself. I remember, uh, this is back maybe like in 2003, uh, we went to Colorado or, or I don't remember, it was out west. It was either Arizona or Colorado for one of these, uh, one of our events. Maybe it was 2008, one of our uh, business events. It was a three-day event where we trained people on the products and all that stuff. It's a convention. And there was a guy who was carrying a cross up the mountain with wheels. I don't remember, do you guys remember that guy carrying the cross all over the country? You know, that's not, I'm not asking you to do that. I'm not saying that, you know, he had, he had uh, bad intentions. I'm just saying it, I think it, it, there's a better use of your time if you read the Bible. You know, if God really wanted you to walk around looking pitiful so that others could be led to Christ, I think Paul would have been the one to do it. Paul was the greatest, you know, evangelist that we know of, right? I mean, that would have probably have been Paul's modus operandi, but that wasn't the case, right? Instead, what was it? It was preaching the gospel. It was, you know, showing the churches how to operate. It was planting churches. It was going out soul winning. It was just standing up for the, for the cause of Christ. And what was the biggest thing? The spiritual battle. I mean, there's verses after verses where he's beat, where he has stripes, where he's thrown in jail. Where they, I mean, they just did all kinds of things. As a matter of fact, I love that, that set of verses. I don't have that here because that's been part of my sermon. But where they stone him and they leave him for dead, he immediately wakes up. And what does he do? He goes into the next city to do the work of the Lord. I mean, how many people would do that? Nowadays, with, with how politically correct we are, if you get stoned and you're unconscious, someone would be like, you know, you need to rest for a couple of days before you really, you know, go out there and do any of that. They didn't know any better, so they just did the work of the Lord. But the very first thing that I wanted to just point out is, you know, set your destination, but don't arrive. And what I mean by that is, don't just think just because you're saved that, that it's all okay. You know, the more we get into, into the Word of God, the more the spiritual battle is going to come. You, get, you know, that's why there's a lot of dead churches. These churches, are, they may be bigger than our church. They may even get bigger tithes. They may have better programs on the surface, but they're dead. Because what they've done is they feel like they've arrived. They forgot the first works. They forgot the foundation. They forgot that it's the gospel that changes the lives. And they think that it's all about being fancy. Or they think it's all about, you know, just how good the church smells. Or how great the lighting is. Or how great the program... And I'm not against any programs, but if it deters from the main program, if it deters from the foundation, and it's no good. I mean, even the Bible tells us that some of it will be like hay and stubble that will burn up. But at least we will still be saved. You know, once we're saved, we're saved forever. But point number two, and go to, uh, go to Galatians. You're there. Go to Galatians 5. Go to Galatians 5. Is Choose whom you will serve daily. And you say, man, Pastor... This is, I've heard this all my life. Good. You should hear it again. You really should. Because even though we know this stuff, do we do, we, uh, do we do everything we need to do daily? I mean, I've been hearing that we should exercise on a regular basis. And let me tell you something. Sometimes I just don't exercise on a regular basis. And I know neither do you. Well, all my life we've been hearing that we should eat the right type of food. And what happens? We don't always eat the right type of food. So it's not like... Like, I'm being repetitive just to be facetious. I'm being repetitive because that's the only way that it's going to stay ingrained in us. And no matter what stage in life you are, how old you are, this is a good reminder. It's a good reminder for us to get up and read our word. It's a good reminder to pray for others. It's a good reminder to esteem others better than ourselves. It's a good reminder to be in church Wednesday evening, Sunday morning, Sunday evening. Maybe go out soul winning on the, you know, once a week at least. Do the things that the Lord has asked you to do. So choose whom you will serve daily. You know, who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve darkness and death and uncleanness, or are you going to serve the light? And you go to there, Galatians 5, verse 16. You know, as, one, as, as I grew in, in the Word, Galatians 5 is also a set of, of Scripture that I really like because one of the things that, that you, 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 you fight as you're clearing up the gospel message is that people will want to confuse the issue of faith alone plus something. 
Even those that say that it's all by grace. I mean, I've talked to more false religions that, that agree with you that it's by grace, through faith, in Jesus Christ. It's not of works. But then they always add something else at the end, right? Well, that's not salvation by faith. That's not a free gift. You know, if I forget money, but if I asked you to do something for me, if I said, hey, I'm going to give you uh, this hundred dollars, but let's say I didn't ask you for anything in return except for you to wash my car. It's not a free gift if you have to do something for me to give that to you. But if I just give it to you, that's a free gift. And people, you say that, Pastor, that's a simple concept to understand. Apparently not, because if that was such a simple concept to understand, we'd be, you know, this place be overfilled and we'd be having people saying amen and you know, it's by grace alone, but the reality is we go door, door knocking, we go soul winning, and we're like, look, it's by grace alone. They're like, no, I just, I just can't accept that. So you're saying that I can get saved and go, you know, be a sinner? Well, the Bible says that you're still a sinner, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the reason is because we're not serving God correctly. And I'm not uh, picking on anybody. I mean, maybe I'm picking on myself more. We have to just continue. It's a process. It's a renewing every day, right? Go to Galatians 5, verse 16, and look at it. says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. How do you not fulfill the lust of the flesh? Walk in the Spirit. Too, too many times, it's more of like, what am I going to do to not fall into sin? I remember, you know, as a young man, you'd go out and, uh, you know, live in the world, and I remember... Uh, you, I had friends who, who liked to drink a lot. And the one thing that was really common ab amongst friends that drank a lot was that they, the next morning they would wake up really hungover. Have you ever met someone who's really hungover and sick? What's the one thing they always say? It doesn't matter what generation, this is probably one of the most common sayings. I will never drink again. I'm so sick. I'm never, ever, ever, ever going to drink again. And then 12 hours later, there they are drinking. Why? Because they're working. They're trying to, it's something that they're trying to do. But right here it says you walk in the Spirit. See, how do you stop sinning? You walk in the Spirit. See, the only one, the only thing that can, can get you to stop doing the things you do is when you let the Lord guide your steps. When you let Him direct your path. It says, for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh, and that's why I love these set of verses, because there it is, the works of the flesh. See, there is no work in the heaven. The work was done by Jesus Christ. I'm talking about us in the, in, in the human flesh. This is the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Then you ever notice how so many religions have these problems? You know why? Because we're all human, right? Adultery fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And then the next set of verses clears that up for us. You say, well, I mean, if the works of the flesh cause this thing, how do we, how do we clear this thing? It says, but the fruit of the Spirit. See, we can't even be the branch on the vine if we don't have the right vine. You know, we're going to yield the wrong type of fruit. It says the fruit of the Spirit. So if we're saved by grace, through Jesus Christ, we're part of the, the vine. Well, then the fruit of that Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against there is no, no such, uh, there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, and here's the key, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. See, sometimes we're a little, we're a little too pious on Sunday morning, you know, because we showed up on Sunday morning. And maybe even Wednesday night, because, hey, nobody else showed up on Wednesday. But did you walk in that Spirit? It's not just enough to show up, but, to, but you've got to also walk in that spirit, right? It says, let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Go over to uh, Deuteronomy 30, and I'll read real quick for you, uh, Romans 12. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. 
See, a service is something you do in the Spirit. You walk in the Spirit. And be not conformed to this world, but be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Look, it's real easy, even in our Christian walk, to get a little high-minded. But don't be so... Your sinner, walk in, in either the flesh or the spirit. It, it doesn't take a lot for you to fall. I mean, and that's why I, I believe God gave us all those great men of God that fell. I mean, and we don't have time to go through that. I mean, obviously David and Solomon and Saul stick out the most. You know, those are some examples, but there's a lot. What happens is, you know, if you're not constantly, what, renewing your mind, you know, if you don't renew a membership, guess what happens? You, you don't get in. If you're, if you're part of a club, like we, my wife and I, we shop at Costco. The only way we get in there is with the membership card. If we don't renew that, and, you know, I don't, I don't care. I could throw a fit. Costco would be just be like, I don't know what you want me to tell you. It's the same thing with walking in the Spirit. If we're not renewing the mind, how do we expect to have the fruit of the Spirit? And go to there to Deuteronomy uh, 30, verse 19. Bible says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set be before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob to give them. You know, we ought to cleave unto the Lord. You can't do that if you don't have the basics. Sometimes we want the, the more exciting things of uh, the Christian walk, but the exciting things in the Christian walk, just like in anything, have to be earned. You know, I mean, it's like the, the, that's the problem with colleges today. And, you know, I don't mean to get on a random colleges, but, you know, I remember when I came out of college in 2002, I graduated with a marketing degree. And, I mean, the way they sold my degree... I was going to come out and I was going to be like this top exec with a, you know, the top suite of whatever city I walked in and the best salary and the best car, flying on jets, eating the best food and drinking the best stuff. I mean, that's literally what I thought from what they had sold me. I remember telling my dad, you know, my dad uh, ran a business and his business always did well. I mean, uh, small to medium sized business, you know, something in the vicinity of hundred thousands, probably up to half a million dollars a year. I'm like, you know what, Dad? I'm going to make more money than you this year. I mean, I remember, I said, starting January, because I graduated in December, I'm going to make $100,000. And when I make more money than you, here's the bet. You know, obviously, we don't bet as Christians, but I wasn't saved then. I said, I'm going to buy you a, a new computer. But when you lose, you're going to buy me a new computer. Guess who ended up buying the computer for who? But that's the problem, right? You think... That, that you you've got it all figured out because you you're not you, you're not cleaving onto the right things. See, I came out and I I had a right, but the reality was what business requires a lot of work and a lot of repetition and a lot of time. You know, if you've ever the the best example that's why I love maybe sales and it correlates so well. Sales requires a daily regimen. I mean, it's like phone calls and follow up and notes and attention to detail. If you're not if you don't do those things, you know, I remember learning a long time ago, sales is the, the easiest, lowest paid job, but it's the, high, it's the hardest, highest paid job. Like if you work really hard at it, you can, well, the same thing with the Christian walk. If you want to live in the spirit, I mean, it requires some work in the spirit, right? It requires some effort into the things that God wants you to do and to renewing your mind and to crucify in the flesh, you know, to walking in the spirit. These are the things that, but you have to choose consciously who you're going to serve daily. I mean, it has to be a con. And sometimes you have to choose who you're going to serve sometimes throughout the day because you wake up in the morning, you're already serving the wrong team. You already, you already got in a fight with your wife or got, you know, lost your temper with your kids or got, you know, set the wrong thing at work or sent an emotional email. By the way, if you're ever in business, don't send an emotional email. That's like the worst thing you can do. But that's a, that's a whole other sermon for another day. But don't send emotional emails. That just makes you look really emotional about the whole thing. Then go over, um, go over if you want, if you please, the Proverbs, and I'll just read for you Joshua real quick. Proverbs 4, 
proper four, and I'm going to just read Joshua 24 to close out the point. The Bible tells us, Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve Him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood in Egypt, and serve you the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. You know, that should be our response, is that God forbid that we should forsake the Lord. The challenge is that is not our response. Most of the time, we do have the gods of the other, uh, of the other side of the flood. We serve the gods of Egypt. It might not be, you know, the same gods but, or in the same manifestation, but it's the same thing. You know, there's a lot of traditions in American culture. But a lot of those American traditions aren't Christian traditions. And I'm not, you know, I'm grateful that, you know, my parents moved to this country. I'm grateful for the things that this country has provided. I don't know that, you know, God put me here so that I could one day get saved. And now I'm preaching in America. You know, I was born in Mexico. But that does not mean that I've also not gotten some bad habits from America. You know, there's certain things that, and you, so you've got to scrutinize everything with the word. But the challenge is, you're not going to be able to make the right changes if the foundation isn't right. You know, choose whom you'll serve when, you, when you're looking for the right church. You know, there is something to be said about the right church. Not every church is the right church. And I know, I know the argument. Every church says that they're the right church. Look, our church is the right church because we follow God's word. It's not because we're Baptist. It's not because some guy decided to start a religion. Or, you know, we have the nicest building. It's because God said, and that's what we do. And you say, well, I, you know, people can gripe and say, well, that, look, I'm not, I didn't say we were 100%. Let me just make that clear. But when, when I look at Pastor Cobb and his ministry, and I, and I follow the word of God, it matches up pretty much, you know, every time. Now, if you want to come to me after service and point out the one time he messed up, don't do it because I'm just going to ignore you. You know, because honestly, I mess up all the time. But if you get it right most of the time, then you know what? That's perfecting the saints. That's how we, that's how we grow. Nobody gets it right 100% of the time. The only one who ever got it right 100% of the time, his name is Jesus. And that's the, the, way, the, the, the way the life, and I mean, the, man, I know I, I use that verse all the time. I am the way, the life, and the truth. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But Jesus is the only way. He's the only one that ever did it right. You know, We've got to get it right on who we serve in our prayer time. Most of the time, you know, when you first learn to pray, you're always praying to ask. But we also got to learn to pray for other people. And there's all kinds of prayers in the Bible, how we apply them, right? You know, for our health, for our families, for the tribulations, for the challenges, that we grow in the Spirit. You know, do, are we reading our Bibles like we should be? How many, how many people have actually read their Bibles from beginning to end? I would... I mean, I was guilty of not reading my Bible till after I got saved. What's interesting is that that's how that's a good way to know, and not, and it's not always the good, the best way. There's, but if if you're you're finding someone who wants to read the Bible and then the Bible's changing them, right? God's word is is, is correcting you. Are you memorizing Scripture? And I, I I'm not very good at memorizing. If you read enough Bible, you're, something's gonna stick. It's like a good song. Even if you're really bad at it, eventually you'll learn the song, right? If you read the Bible long enough, it'll stick. If you're teaching it to someone, it'll stick. If you're teaching it to your children, it'll stick. You know, are we, are we doing the basics when it comes to church fellowship? How are we treating our brothers and sisters in Christ? Not our brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, are we being obedient to the Word of God? The reason, I, And there is a purpose to what I'm trying to set up for the final point, because are we being obedient to the Word of God? You know, there's many times where I've had to change my position on what I thought was biblical because God's word trumps whatever I think. You know, and, and you know, you've heard me talk about that, and I, you know, I'll continue preaching it to the day that I die, but those are the things. Are we doing what God says when it comes to temptation? Are we doing what God says to, you know, and just name it, to the wicked sins of the world? Are we abstaining from evil? Are we abhorring evil? We're going to see that. Go, go over... Uh, Go over to Proverbs 4. But, you know, not every trial in our lives is a big trial for everyone to witness. You know, at times the struggle is just internal. It's between you and God and you and that the inner man and the flesh, right? 
But these are the struggles that prepare you for the big struggles. See, most of the time, it's the big struggles. That's why, you know, for at least when you're growing up as a young man, movies like Rocky and Rambo, you know, they, those were movies that I liked watching. Why do you like watching those kind of movies when you were a young man? Because there's a hero, right? He's the guy who, I mean, he gets all the glory and he's unstoppable and mentally he's got a great mental fortitude and they can they're like there's no nothing that can stop them but the reality is you don't get to that point unless you've done the work you know and I'm going to show you this biblically so go to Proverbs 4 verse 1 says hear ye children the instruction of a father and attend to no understanding for I give you good doctrine see if you've got good doctrine that should be the direction of your life it says forsake ye not my law for I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words. Keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Forget it not. Neither decline from, my wor from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting get understanding so you know it's not just enough to get the wisdom but get the understanding and, it, and he's talking and says for I give you good doctrine what's doctrine it's you know what we believe it's the truth right it's the truth of the Bible well there's false doctrines also and many times we can't fight the big battles because we're confused about the doctrines of the Bible and so then that makes you either timid or unprepared for the battle but if God's word is willing to change, if you're willing to change on a dime for God's word, then you're going to get the good doctrine. Uh, go to Ephesians 6, and we'll start wrapping this thing up. But go to Ephesians 6. I'll read for you John 7, uh, verse 16. says, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Look, we got to be willing to also just admit when we're wrong. One of the things about being basic is that when you go to the basics, you realize how complicated you've complicated some things in your life. I mean, it's real easy when you step back and you're like, whoa, hold on. All I really need to do in life is A, B, and C. Why, are, why do we have X, Y, and Z over here? You know, what is it? What was I thinking when we did this? Or why did I make this decision? Because we, we just forget sometimes. You know, and I don't know, maybe I'm speaking more to myself than somebody in the congregation, but I really think that that's something that, that we need to address just as a church. You know, it's, to me, if there's a lot of uh, attacks, if there's a lot of trials and tribulations, that's a good thing. Then it's a good reminder to stay in the basics. Let's not get too distracted with, with some of the other things. You know, Second Peter 2, while you're there in Ephesians, Second Peter 2, verse 1, says... But there were false prophets also among you, among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. See, we've got to know our good doctrine so we know what's damnable heresies. See, there's things that, you know, I might preach that you might not agree on. But is that really a point of contention? I mean, is that really the basic way to fellowship with a brother and sister in Christ? You know, is that, hey, pastor, I didn't, you know, you said, and, and the Bible said something else. I, I don't know if I can continue coming to church. I mean, we've had church members here that leave because we preached against the Catholics. We've had church members leave because, uh, well, at least I know of one church member that, that didn't show up anymore because I, myself, I'm talking about myself, because I associated with pastors in that movement I call the new IFB movement. What does that have to do with salvation? And I know Pastor Cobb has, a, has hit his, you know, I know we've had people leave on, on the point of, you know, communion. We've had people leave for all kinds, none of that has anything to do with the bottom line. You know, if we're talking like, you know, I, I, sorry, maybe I'm mixing the business. It has nothing to do, with, now are those things important? Yeah, but there's a way to address them. Actually, biblically, there's a way to address them. There's even a way to address an elder in the church with two or three witnesses correctly. There's ways to do this, but, but if somebody was preaching a damnable heresy, you better believe that I'm not only will, it, will I address it, but I hope that if somebody addresses it, that we would back them. That's a serious 
thing. You know, someone that the Bible says, let them be accursed, as Galatians 1, 9 said, you know, as we have said before, so I now say again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you that ye have received, that ye have not, I mean, that ye have received, let him be accursed. But go to Ephesians 6, and most people, when you turn to Ephesians 6, you think I would close out with the whole armor of God, but really, I want to focus on the basics. See, the message is back to the basics. And you're going to see there, when we're going to stop at verse 11, right before the whole armor. But we're there in verse number 1, and what does he say? It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. See, there's no coincidence that verse 1 starts with obeying, and then at the end, in the middle, we have that battle between the flesh. It says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? But against principalities, and it tells us to put on the whole armor of God. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. And by the way, wrath and anger are two different things. Provoking your children to wrath is a serious thing. It says, uh, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and single, in singleness of your heart. As that, you're ma as that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and tremble. I'm sorry, I, the, I got thrown off right there. I read the line twice. Verse 5 says, Servants, be obedient to them that bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So, man, my eyes are really playing tricks on me. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters, do the same thing unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither, neither is there respect of persons with him. Finally, and that's the verse I wanted to focus on, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. See, it's not put on the whole armor of God. He gives us a whole list of things that we should be aware of and that we should do. And then he says, and then finally put on the whole armor. Of, I mean, and finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. See, too many times we want to just Put on the armor and go into battle. And let me tell you something. I'm willing to defend my family. I mean, I'm willing to defend my, 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 my colleagues. You know, people always talk, I don't know if that, that would ever happen now. I think wars are different now than, you know, but if, if there was an invasion, I'd be willing to, you know, fight to the end to, to protect our family and friends and neighbor. But let me just tell you something. I'm not a soldier. That's not, I'm a soldier in Christ, but I'm not a physical soldier. I'd probably be a horrible soldier because I've not been through boot camp. I have not had weapons training. I've had not had like hand-to-hand uh, uh, -hand combat training. I, I'd probably fail. For all I know, I'd probably be one of the first killed because I wouldn't know the first thing about, you know, being in the battlefield, right? But if you take a soldier in the same situation, let's say there's an invasion, all of a sudden they attack and Houston's under attack, the veterans, the, the soldier, man, they'll, be, they'll know what to do, right? Because they had that foundation first. It's interesting if you ever kind of look at, I remember watching this many years ago, they used to have shows about the SEALs and the, and the Marines and all that. Well, these are soldiers that are now going to be elite soldiers. And, and what's interesting is to be a soldier, you got to go through boot camp, right? And you go to boot camp and you become a soldier. But then if you want to jump that rank or you want to be that elite soldier like a Ranger or, or a Marine or a Navy SEAL, what do you have to go do? You have to go into boot camp again. This is a trained soldier who now has to go retrain, and what are they doing? They're taking them back to the basics. They're saying, look, we want to make sure that you didn't forget the most basic thing before you even can get to the elite status. And that's what I'm talking about today is, look, if we want to be the elite in the spiritual battle of Christ, we have to get these basics right. I mean, this boot camp stuff can't leave us. Have you ever met, I mean, my father-in-law, is a, he says he's a ranger. He's, he hasn't been a, you know, in the military for, I don't know, like over 40 years, but to, you know, you, you talk to him and he's a ranger. You know what's one of the things that he does regularly? Push-ups, sit-ups, goes running. You know, all the boot camp stuff he used to do, he still does it today. The basics are what keep him, you know, his mind 
still thinking that he's a ranger because he knows that all he has to do is just turn on the instinct. That's what we need to do. We need to be in that. And let's go ahead and close out in Romans 12, verse 9. Go to Romans 12, verse 9. So, you know, set your destination, but don't arrive. Don't think that just because you're saved, you've arrived. Let's, let's get people discipled. Let's train them in the spiritual battle of God, right? And then let's, let's, let's educate ourselves and educate our families and our congregations on who we should choose daily. Because it is a daily choice that has consequences, immediate consequences and long-term consequences. And then, you know, once we've, we, we've, uh, we've done all that, then we have the courage to succeed when the consequences come. And I didn't give you the third point. Proverbs 4 was part of that. But we'll have that courage to succeed when those consequences come. Romans 12 verse 9 says, Let love be without dissimulation. Let's, meaning, don't let it be fake. It says, Abhor... That's another word for hate. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. And I talked about cleaving unto God, right? It says, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring, preferring, um, preferring one another. Not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer. Distributing to the necessity of the saints given to hospitality, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not, rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep, be of the same mind one toward another, mind not the high things, be con but condescend to men of low estate, be not wise in your own conceit, recompense to no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire in his head, on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. I really think that's a pretty basic list. And what I mean by that is those are the basics. You know, we're, we're going to, this church will continue, and it will continue to face challenges. But I think that a message like this should be brought every few years, every few months, depending on the situation. Because that's, it's so easy to just get distracted in life. It's so easy. Have you ever been driving down the road, and now it happens so much, you're on the phone. You know, I, I used to do it, I used to go all the way when I was working for the dental company. I used to go all the way to 45 and, and like Wayside. And I remember, I, you know, you get used to driving home and your, your automatic response turns on. I, I remember I'd be on the road and I was supposed to go somewhere else. And I'm on the phone and next thing you know, I'm exiting like I'm headed home. I'm like, man, I, I, I just drove 20 miles the wrong way. I, it's not even time to go home. You know, you're on the highway and your body just knows that that's where you're supposed to go. And you didn't get off the right exit. You didn't turn on the right turn. Next thing you know, you're like, what am I going to do now? Now I got to turn all the way back. You know why? Because you forgot the basics. What's the basics? You know, check what you're doing. You know, obviously, if you have, you're at work, this is where I'm supposed to go. No, you're just, you're all over the place. And so the thing that we've got to do most importantly is just get back to the basics. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to just preach a message like this. You know, thank you for such a wonderful church. You know, there's no place I'd rather be than here tonight, Lord, with, you know, our family, our church family, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And, you know, we... We're, we're there for each other. We learn from each other. We're there to help each other. And Lord, I just pray that we can apply this word to our lives so that we can go out there and together in one accord fight this spiritual battle and be stronger yet for you, Lord, and, and expanding the kingdom and the cause for Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.